Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. And now, brothers and sisters, we come to the final chapter, the most beautiful chapter, and that is the final abode and the end of the journey from this world to finally being with our Creator, Allah. From Him we came, and to Him we shall return. My brothers and sisters, the topic about the pleasures of paradise is a topic which relieves the heart, a topic which gives a person ease and happiness. More than anything, it increases the hope in this very difficult world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to us than our jugular vein. And he knows, he knows exactly what you and I are going through. Everyone has a story. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to enter his paradise. When my brother and son, rahmatullahi alayhim, passed away, and may Allah have mercy on your loved ones, one of the topics which kept me hopeful and connected to them was the topic of paradise, Jannah. Because when you know the hereafter and where the souls have gone and what will happen, the hope rises and your love for Allah increases and your mental health becomes better. Your spiritual health starts to get better and your distresses leave you until you're left with a pain of love and you build around it. But we know, alhamdulillah, this is the first chapter. And then the journey does not end with death, for our meeting is coming soon, inshallah. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He promised Jannah to the muttaqin, to those who fear Him. And what does fearing Allah mean? The word fear, we normally think of a beast or something that we're scared of. My daughter taught me this once. She touched the barbecue and I said to her, don't touch the barbecue and she got scared. So she started to cry and ran towards me. I was busy the first time, then second time and she continued to hold on to me. You can probably relate to your own children or your own little brothers and sisters. And then I put her on my lap and she calmed down until she slept. She slept in my lap. And I wondered what the fear of Allah really means. When Allah says in the Quran, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى Allah," Run away to Allah. You run away from something. And in the next verse, Allah says, Run away to Allah. إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ The Messenger said to his people, I am to you from Allah, a warner from him. How can you run for the one that you are warning me from? Run to Allah who you are warning me from? Uh, from my little daughter, I noticed and learnt. She's not running away from her father. But she's running away from losing the love of her father. She wants it back. That's what she was fearing. She was fearing that experience, that feeling of that connection and she thought she had lost it. So fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means fearing losing the love and the connection with Him because if there's no love and connection with Allah, there is a void in our heart that can never be filled with anything. You can lose the most beloved people to you in this world and you'll still go inshallah. You'll still be going because you have Allah with you all the way. And this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although we cannot see Him now, we will see Him again in the hereafter. Seeing Allah in itself, seeing Allah in itself is one of the rewards of paradise which only those who deserve it will get it. But instead right now we see the effects that Allah left behind. You know the Creator from His creation. Scientifically speaking, you analyze what's left behind. And when you look and it has both a design 
and a purpose, then you know there has to be an intelligent creator behind it. The guy who invented Bic, the pen, was the most perfect creation of a human being or invention that everyone, anyone has ever known. And when you look at that little pen and the way that the ink is inside, you realize it has almost a perfect design. But it didn't make it for no purpose, it has a purpose that we write and we share knowledge. A monkey didn't make it. You didn't even have to see who made it. You know it's an intelligent human because it has design and purpose. Look around you. Allah says to us, if you are any, in any doubt that you will be returning back to me and that I will resurrect you from death into life again, and you think that this is absurd or fantasy, then all you have to do is look backwards. Look at what happened before. Were you something, were you at one time nothing? Before you were born, what were you? And Allah says, suddenly you are a living, breathing, walking human being. Did you come from nothing or did you make yourself? Even if you believe in evolution, and part of it Muslim Islam agrees with, part of it, but not the fact that evolution made itself. You need to have an intelligent being because it has design and purpose. The Creator Allah tells us just as He began your creation in the beginning, the first time He can repeat your creation again. In fact, every morning we wake up and we're alive again. So the meeting will happen again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that day. Allah is the most merciful. The journey of the hereafter and the day of judgment is a remarkable, phenomenal story. In the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers us and each person will be gathered with those who they are alike. Whoever you used to imitate and be like in this world, Allah will put you with them. So those who used to love the prophets and messengers and try to be like them, Allah will put them close to them. فَالْأَمْثَلُ فَالْأَمْثَلُ Then those who were similar and then those who were similar. On that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the dead from their graves. And Allah says in the Quran, He will gather you. All of our deeds are put forth. And Allah says, whoever's deeds are heavy has succeeded and whoever's deeds are light has failed. But the mercy of Allah is always there. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I told you before, rewards for the little deeds as much as the mountains. And perhaps a person could do a big deed, but to Allah it's small based on the intention. Maybe they did it to show off. Maybe they did it for fame and fortune. And there are others who would do a small deed, which is equal to mountains upon mountains, even if they don't look as religious outside as other people. For something in their heart, when they did it, made the whole difference. One man from the children of Israel, as our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us, of the children of Israel in the past had a friend. And his friend was extremely disobedient and sinful. And the other friend was religious. And one day he kept on advising him. And then one day he got sick of him. And he said to him, Allah will never forgive you. The Prophet peace be upon him said Allah replied through his angels saying Where is this person who is trying to represent God on earth? Who told you I will never forgive him? I have forgiven him. Take him to paradise and take his friend to hellfire because he made himself a God. He did shirk. He made partners with Allah. How could you say who's going to paradise and who's going to hellfire? That's my decision, Allah said. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks into our hearts and then to our actions. And on a day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives who He wills and punishes who He wills. The journey goes on. And after weighing our deeds on the scale and receiving our books in our right or in our left, we have to cross a bridge called As-Sirat. Allah says, وَإِن 
ربك حتما مقضيا. Every single one of you is going to cross this bridge. It is an ordained absolute fact that everyone is going to do. The Sirat is a dark place. And the way that you cross the Sirat as told by our Prophet wasallam, is with the light that you carry with you from this world. The light that you carry with you from this world is interpreted from your good deeds which you used to do in secret and in open. And Allah multiplies it depending on your intentions and that becomes your light through which you pass this section. The Prophet wasallam said some of you will pass like the blink of an eye. Some of you will pass like a flying object, some of you will pass running, some of you will pass walking and some of us will pass crawling and some of us will fall into the fire. We ask Allah to save us. Amen. Then when the people are passing the Sirat, there come the people who looked religious, but they were in fact hypocrites. Allah knew their hearts, we didn't know. These hypocrites they will try to prostrate on that day, but their backs will be turned into steel and they will be the first through which they will be thrown into the fire. Then the believers pass, depending on their level. And once the believers have passed, I quote to you a hadith authentic from Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, when they pass the Sirat, and the believers who had passed, they are successful. And they made it. And their way now is towards paradise, the doors of Jannah. They remember something. What do the believers remember? They remember their friends. They remember their family. They remember their mom and dad. They remember their brother and sister. They remember their cousins and their friends who they used to pray with sometimes and those who used to give da'wah to and try to call and help. They don't see them. They didn't make it. Then the Prophet wasallam says, I stand on the Sirat and I call out to Allah and I prostrate. Only Allah knows how long I do and I say words I've never said before. And then Allah says to him, Ya Muhammad, irfa rasak. O oh Muhammad, lift your head. Washfa'atu shaffa. And intercede, I will give you intercession. Was'al du'ata. And ask for anything I will give you on this day. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the only one who will be given this opportunity. Why? He already told us. That was cringy. <laughs> I haven't even reached the, you know, the, okay, just getting there. Are we there? Do it at the end, inshallah. Okay, lost the momentum. That's like photo bombing. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, let's move on. Rasul Sallallahu when he was alive, he said every prophet had a dua. And they all used that special dua. Except for me. They said, what did you do with it, Ya Rasulullah, your special dua? He said, I left it for the hereafter. He prostrated one day, although the hadith has weakness in its chain, but the context is correct because it's, it's supported by other hadiths. He was praying one day and Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, was with him. When he finished, he sat next to her. And then he said, she said, Ya Rasulullah, make a dua for me. So he said, I ask Allah for all the goodness for you and to keep away all the bad from you, and to save you on the day when there will be no other person who will help, and to make paradise your abode and save you from the fire. And he kept on making this dua until she kept on laughing from happiness until she says, my head dropped into my lap out of happiness. This is how much Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my husband loved me. Special dua for me. Then the Prophet Sallallahu lifted her head up with it chin and said, Ya Aisha, do you know what? Did you love that dua? She said, how can I not love it? <laughs> and he said, Wallahi, this is my dua for my ummah every night. Aww. He loves us like he loved his wife. And one day he stood at the graves and as if he was farewelling and Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu was with him 
And he said, mercy upon you, O home of the believing people. And we shall follow very soon. We give you glad tidings of paradise. And then he said, Ah, wadatu Allah ra'ayna ikhwanana. The only thing I will miss is that I haven't yet met our brothers. They said, Ya Rasulullah, are we not your brothers? We're living around you. He said, You are my ashab, you are my companions. My brothers I'm talking about are not born yet. He said, Ya Rasulullah. How will you know them? He said, on a day of judgment, I will be waiting at the fountain. I will be calling them one by one. They said, how will you know them, Ya Rasulullah, when you've never seen them? They're not even born. He said, they believed in me, but have never seen me. On a day of judgment, I will know them by the light that emanates from their face, their arms and their legs. They said, from what, Ya Rasulullah? He said, from the wudu and the salat they used to do. The wudu and the salat. Abu Hurairah who said, I started making more wudu and more exaggerated with it, so my light can increase. <laughs> he said, I will notice them among all the people and I will call them to the fountain when they're thirsty to drink from my hand, or to, to drink from my fountain. And then when he does this shafa and says, Allah says to him, lift your head up, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad al nasirah and ask for anything you want, the Prophet Sallallahu will say immediately the first word, Allahumma ummati ummati. My Lord, save my ummah, save my ummah. Save my nation, save my nation. And every Prophet will go to talk for their own people, but Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi will ask for us. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He then says to the angels, drive the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Him. Some of them will fall. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues what we call the shafa'ah. Now we go back to the believers who have passed. They look back and the Prophet ﷺ describes their state. He says, فَلَهُمْ أَشَدُّ مُنَاجَاتٍ لِلَّهِ They are more intensified in their call to Allah. These believers, they cross the Sirat. They call upon Allah with such intensity. As if you are standing at a court about to be sentenced to death and you are arguing your case so that you can stay alive. That's how they will be calling to Allah. For who? For their friends, their family and those who fell in the fire. And I will say, oh, our Lord. Each person says, I remember Fatima, I remember Aisha, I remember Muhammad, I remember Ahmad, I remember Alan, I remember, I remember. And they say, my Lord, Wallahi, Wallahi, I saw them praying with us on Eid. Wallahi, Wallahi, I saw them at a charity event. Wallahi, Wallahi, one day I saw them, they saw a homeless person and they gave him some food. <coughs> Wallahi, my, our Lord, by your name, we remember that they talked to someone and relieved them from their, from their hardship. I remember someone, they helped someone who was sick and they took them to the hospital. I remember someone, and they, Rasul Sallallahu says, they try so hard to remember one little tiny good thing that they can hold on to, just to use it to say, oh Allah, take him out of, hell, out of hellfire. They've got some good deeds. Now Allah left it like that because He wants to show us the brotherhood and His mercy. At the same time, these people have to cleanse themselves. Allah is the most just. So then Allah says to them, go back. And whoever you identify from the people from the former life, here are my angels with you, take them out. So you go and you see them. Some of them haven't gone deep yet. Allah, God knows, Allah knows what this fire is like. Is it lava or is it acid? I don't know. Some of them have gone to their knees, others to their shoulders, others to their ankles, and some of them have gone deep. No one can see them anymore. And then they realize their faces, it hasn't been burnt. And the Sahabas, they said, Ya Rasulullah, what will stop our faces from being burnt? He said, because the faces used to make prostration. Allah will not let the fire touch your forehead. So those who prayed on and off even, and those who wanted to pray, maybe their faces will still be seen, and, but there are others who have gone deep. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who do salah. They will save them and the angels will take out until they say, Ya Rabb, there's still other friends. And Allah says, go back and see them. Go back and see them. They keep going back and forth. Brothers and sisters, if you don't see me, please remember me. <laughs> Will you remember me? I don't know. Inshallah, I remember you. And then finally, they say, Allah says, are all your friends out? And they say, Ya Rab, we can't remember anymore else. We don't know. There are people who nobody knew. They're gone. And Allah says, the messengers have interceded. The believers have interceded. The angels have interceded. Only my intercession is left.
And then Allah takes out of hellfire numbers of people that no one could count. They are the people. Allah says to, to these friends, they say to them, take out of hellfire whom you can remember a coin's worth of a good deed in their life. Then I say, Ya Rab, all the ones worth a coin are gone. What about the other? It says, go and take out those who have half a coin's worth of good deeds. One little tiny good deed they can remember. So long as they believed in Allah, of course. Finally, Allah says, my turn. And He takes out anyone who had an atom's worth of a good deed any time in their life. <laughs> they are called the poor people of paradise. They enter paradise and they would have been burnt into charcoal. They're, they're dead. They actually die. Only these people die. And they are washed in the river of paradise called the river of life. And they grow again. So they go and a little bone, the Cossack's bone that is in the back, Cossack's bone, it grows from it once again. And then their sides are made into nur, light. And their soul is placed back into them. And they live in the lowest part of paradise. Because they're the ones who had an answer's worth of good deed, that's all. As for the others, where will they be? You see them like the stars. There are levels in paradise, each one where they deserve. The last person to enter paradise, last person, the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Cutting the story short, he will come out and he will think that nobody else has been saved but him. Because everybody is busy with themselves. So he sits there between Jannah and Jahannam, hellfire and paradise somewhere. And Allah makes a tree grow at a distance. He hadn't seen a tree for a long time. So he says, my Lord, please put me under the shade of that tree. The people of the fire are disturbing me and I just don't want to remember it anymore. He says, my servant, I will put you there so long as you don't ask me for anything else. He says, I promise you. So he places him under that tree. And while he's there, Allah makes another tree more magnificent grow a little bit of a distance away. He says, Ya Rabbi, I promise you I won't say anything, but well, I promise you, if you put me under that tree, I will not ask you for anything else. So Allah puts him under that tree while Allah knows that the human being cannot handle the beauty that Allah has created. It's deliberate. So Allah then, he teases him with a third tree. And it's even more magnificent with fruits and there's a river underneath it. He says, Ya Rabbi, please, I promise you, I will never ask you for anything else. Put me under that tree. Allah says, nothing else is nothing else. When he puts him under that tree, he's closer to the door of paradise. Then he hears the laughter and the singing and the beauty behind that door. He says, my Lord, what is behind that door? He says, that's none of your business. He says, can I just look inside? Just look, look, but not touch. Allah says, Abdi, you told me, my friend, my servant, you said this, you said that. He says, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. After a long time, he says, all right, I'll let you see. So he enters paradise. He's only looking now. And then he starts to cry. He says, Mayub King, what's making you cry, my servant? He said, I realize, my Lord, that I'm the last one and there's no place left for me. The guy was intending to ask him, can I have some of it? <laughs> Wallahi, I only quote what the Prophet ﷺ says. He says, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he laughs. Now, of course, we don't make any comparison between what Rasulullah described Allah and what we do. Allah's laughter and His hearing and His seeing is nothing that can be described. But the point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He shows him that Allah is happy with him. And He says, my servant, why would you think that there's no place for you? Don't you know my kingdom never runs out? How about I give you from this paradise as much as the greatest king that ever lived on earth? And the servant says to Allah, my servant, oh Allah, Oh no, this is where he laughs. He says, oh Allah, are you mocking me now? Wallah, he said, atastahzi wa ya Rabbi. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laughs and he says, no, but my kingdom never runs out. You will have as much as the greatest king. And again, 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 ten times. In another verse it says, Allah multiplies it later on to be as much as the earth by ten times. And then he realizes that there are other people who had major sins in this life, which Allah forgave and turned them into good deeds because they had repented, right? So Allah turns some people's sins that they did into good deeds and their level in paradise goes more. 
So the guy gets very greedy. And he says, my Lord, he says, yes. He says, I also have major sins as well. <laughs> you know, I, I, can I say them? <laughs> And Allah says, Oh, children of Adam, just go into paradise and stop asking questions. Why? Because Allah hides people's sins when they hide them in this world and they felt bad about them. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers your sins in this world and you're trying to be a better person, don't confess them. Allah says, keep them between me and you. Perhaps Allah will forgive them and keep it a secret. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the best for you. Finally, brothers and sisters, everybody... So let's get back a little bit. Everybody's waiting at the door of Jannah. And there are eight doors to paradise and seven doors into hellfire. So Allah always makes more for paradise. The door of fasting, the gate of patience, the gate of uh, goodness to your parents, the gate of a high and best character, because there is a place for people with the highest and best character with people in paradise, a special door for them. There is the gate of those who sponsored orphans and looked after the poor and the needy. There's the gate of those who strived and struggled and resisted injustice and so on. So many doors of paradise and each one goes from the door that they best did well at. And some of them get to choose any gate. And behind that gate there are things that you cannot see behind any other door. The first one who will enter is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who will knock on the door and the angels, the guardians. And the guardian of paradise is called Ridwan. The guardian of hellfire is called Malik. Malik has never smiled since the day Allah created hellfire. And the angel Rudwan, which means pleasure, has never ever shown a frown face or a sad face since the day Jannah has been created. And then he says, open for Rasulullah. They say, it is you who we have been told to open the door to. The Prophet ﷺ then enters. And then women enter who are close to the Prophet ﷺ in righteousness. So Maryam alayhi salam, Asya, the, the wife of Pharaoh, Fatima radiallahu anha, Zahra, Khadija radiallahu anha. And then the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi, by Allah, one gate of paradise is like the distance from here to Sana'a. The Prophet ﷺ was in Medina. The distance from there is like from there to, to Iraq. From Medina to Iraq, from Saudi to Iraq. The door is so wide and he said, by the one who possesses my soul in his hands, Wallahi, the doors will be jammed from the amount of people rushing in. And the Prophet ﷺ describes them how they will go in. He says, the first people that will enter will be the best, most righteous of this world. And they will hold each other by their elbows like this. And they'll be so nervous and tapping their feet and looking at each other. Are you ready? Wallah, he describes them like children in the kindergarten you know, entering. They're so excited. He said, are you ready? Are you ready? This is it. This is it. And then they enter behind the Prophet ﷺ and then the ones after. And there will be people who will have their children who passed away. They'll be waiting at the doors and they will say, My Lord, I will not enter until they come in. And they will say, My Lord, I've been waiting. I will not enter until I grab the, uh, the clothes of my parents. And I'll enter with them. May Allah make us among them. These children will be your intercessors. So if you lost a child at birth, or you lost a child that was small, or someone that you loved and you were patient all your life, they will not enter paradise until you make it there. Yeah. When we enter paradise, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes angels come out in paradise. And Allah <coughs> describes this situation. He says, we reunite them with their families. Because what's Jannah without your family and your loved ones? You can't party without the people you loved. You're not alone. And Allah says, we reunite their families and they enter together. Allah says, paradises, gardens of everlasting life, they will enter it and all the righteous ones among their children and their family will be with them together. 
and their spouses. And then the angels will enter upon them from all corners, coming and smiling and saying to them, Peace be upon you, peace be upon you. <laughs> the first words you hear in paradise is what? Peace be upon you. Why? Because this world was claustrophobic. We went through too much in this world. And finally we reach peace, which everyone yearns for. And the angels confirm it and they validate it. Peace be upon you. You will never feel sadness ever again. For what? As a result of your patience and perseverance that you went through. That's how you got to paradise. And the angels, they come after you and they show you everything. And they show you your palaces. And people will know their gardens. So can you just, just choose a place in the sky? It's probably a million light years in size. Can you imagine your palace that big, your gardens that big? Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Jannatin arduha samawati wa ard. Paradise, a garden, which is larger than the heavens and the earth. This entire universe that is expanding and Allah knows what rate. Jannah is beyond that. And when you enter there, you walk and you look beneath you and what do you see? You see pebbles. Like when you go outside to the street and you see little pebbles on the floor. Rocks. Who cares about them? Are they worth anything? Those pebbles in paradise are pearls, rubies and diamonds. And they don't hurt your feet, by the way. And when you go to your palaces and there is this beautiful place, you meet your spouse. And your nur and your beauty is beyond imagination. The beauty that you have in paradise, there is nothing like it in the universe. Even the angels are in awe at your beauty. You are as old as 33 because it's considered to be the peak of your age. Men don't have beards. But if you want beards, go ahead. <laughs> they have youthful faces, strong bodies, the strength of a hundred men. Hubba hubba. <laughs> because you get to enjoy in paradise all enjoyments. Everything you can imagine. In paradise, you meet with your spouses, you've got servants, they serve you, and they're so happy to serve you. There is no tiredness, there is no sleep that you need, there is no more work, there is no more old age, there's no more sickness. You don't even go to the toilet. Like the backside, there's no backside. <laughs> when I say backside... <laughs> I'm going to say this, brothers. Sisters, can you leave so I can talk to the brothers a bit? I need to tell them some things. It's man to man talk. So the backside is only for attraction, but not for the toilet. Because when you eat, you don't need to go to the toilet. They don't need to go to do anything, they don't release anything like that because there is no smell in paradise. Even your sweat that comes out of you, that's how the food comes out. But it comes out as musk and perfume. The Prophet ﷺ said, you don't even need to spit. There is no saliva. There is no mucus. There is no snots. Nothing. And the first meal that is called an appetizer, you get to get an appetizer. <coughs> Do you know what the first, absolute first appetizer you get? First of all, you get a drink. It's wine. Wine mixed with ginger from paradise. Like no wine that the world has ever seen. The Prophet said, in it there are things no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no heart has ever even imagined. You can think with your brain, but did you know the heart thinks before the brain? This is a recent study. It is now almost established that the heart thinks before the brain. And the Rasul said, what no heart has ever imagined. You know sometimes you get a feeling, and you want to describe it, but you can't. And Allah says, even that, Nobody has ever experienced. You have you're in paradise. There are feelings that you've never even had in this world that you cannot describe, let alone know what they are. In paradise, no heart has ever imagined. And you get that wine, but you don't get intoxicated. So there's no after effects. There's no headaches. There's no vomiting. You just enjoy it. And the first appetizer you get before the main meal. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
كانت لهم جنات الفردوس نزلا. Those who believe in Allah and do righteous deeds, they will have paradise as nuzula. Nuzula means as guests. You first come in as guests. And when you are a guest, the host is Allah. He gives you and gives you and gives you with this meal. The first appetizer is the spleen of a whale. No, no, you're not going to say that in paradise. Brother, <laughs> He's got another trend now, banging the table. <laughs> Ariel got him as a good friend, good friend. <laughs> so, but the spleen is not like any that you've ever tasted. So, you know, you don't, if you don't like fish, it's because you've had a bad experience with fish. But the fish in paradise is something else. You go, is this spleen? Oh my God, what is that? feel so hungry then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings to you with through the angels beef from a buffalo that has been grazing on the most tender parts of the grasses of paradise since it was created it will be slaughtered and you will eat from it and then the buffalo will come back alive so nothing dies in paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel to the silat that he says oh people of hellfire oh people of jannah the people of hellfire look up and they think, oh, this is hope. Maybe there's something else. Maybe we're going to come out. And the people of paradise go, oh, are we going to come out? Is something being changed? And then the angel comes and brings a sheep. And he says, oh, people of paradise, oh, people of hellfire, this is death. And he slaughters that symbolic <coughs> sheep. And he says, people of Jannah, everlasting living, no more death for you. Oh, people of hellfire, everlasting in there, no more death for you. You eat this meal and you have fun and you wish for anything your heart desires. And then, as you are there, your mind is taken away by all this beauty. <coughs> and someone says, Come everyone, come. An announcement <coughs> is made. All the people of paradise, all the prophets, all the messengers. Rasulullah is there. Everyone who was ever dead is now alive there in paradise. And then they say, there is a meeting place that you have to go to because there's one more thing Allah wants to give you. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari as well. The believers all go on their chariots and their horses and whatever it is creature that you desire, with your family and your spouse, romantic beyond your imagination, and with your servants and angels with you. And you go to this meeting place where all the inhabitants of paradise meet. Something major is about to happen. And then you hear Allah. Now Allah speaks to you. And He says, Oh, my servants. And you all say, Labbaika Rabbi. Our Lord, we are here to do anything for you. Anything you tell us. And Allah says, No, I have a question. Are you satisfied? Are you pleased? Here in this world, say, Allah yirda alayk. May Allah be pleased with you. Allah says, Are you pleased with what I have given you? Are you satisfied with this hospitality? La ilaha illa. And all of them with one voice from beginning to end say, Rabbana, our Lord, how can we not be pleased when you have saved us from the fire and make us enter paradise forever? We have forgotten everything, our Lord. How could even this question be asked? <coughs> and Allah says, I have something else for you that my pleasure will be bestowed upon you forever and you will never ever experience any fear of anything whatsoever. And for you is whatever your eyes want to taste and whatever your hearts desire. Then he said, but there is one more reward that I am yet to give you that I have not yet given you and I have promised you when you were living in the former life. He said, what is it, Ya Rabb, after all of this? They had forgotten because of the beauty of paradise, they forgot. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He releases the veil that covers the eyesight between you and seeing Allah. And then you all stand and you look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
you see Allah Jalla Jalalu. In Surah Al Qiyamah, on that day, faces will be bright with happiness and excitement looking at its Lord, looking at their Lord. Rasul says, The sight of Allah to the people of paradise will be such that everything they have been given and seen to this point. They forget it all. They forget it all. And they just want to stare at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forever. What is this sight? Whatever your mind imagines, it is not that. Allah is beyond anyone's imagination. He is beyond anything you could ever imagine. He's not like anything. But what is the sight of Allah? The sight of Allah is the seal of the beauty and reward that Allah gives you in paradise. Some scholars said, had the people of hellfire with their torture see Allah once, they'll forget all the pain that they are in. So Allah does not give them that reward. Allah save us. And some people speak to Allah on a daily basis. Some people see Allah and speak on a, on a weekly basis. You might think, well, is there night and day? No, there's always light. There's never heat too much, never cold too much. Oh, but I want to sleep. Why would you want to sleep in paradise? Your dreams are right in front of you, real. Oh, but I want to. Go ahead. Some people in paradise say, I want to have children. <laughs> After all that, labor and all. But some people do. Let's experience having children of Jannah. They're born in paradise. Prophet said a woman can get pregnant and give birth in one hour with no pain whatsoever and her body and everything about her returns exactly as if she never had a child. Some people want crops and grains to farm. <laughs> Rasul said there are people who want crops and grains to farm. And in one better one he said, Ya Rasulullah, it must be one of the Muhajireen, the Meccan people or, or, or the Medina, but they love farming man, they just can't get rid of it. Because they were known for it. He says, I don't think it's a better one. Rasul Sallallahu laughed and he said, Wallahi, you plant the seed and you see your eyesight and the growth starts racing each other. How quick, the beauty, the colors, the what? You look at a tree and you want an apple. You say, I used to have apples. His angels say, no, it's not the same apple. So you eat the apple. He goes, tastes nothing like an apple. Tastes something amazing. Then the angels say, eat another one. He says, no, no, I want to get enough. He goes, you will never, ever get full. In paradise, you don't get full and you never get hungry. So you go to another apple and it tastes completely different. Then you see the rivers. Then you want a chocolate river. Kids here, chocolate. You swim in it. You talk to the fish and the fish are chocolate. <laughs> if you want, you can have caramel if you like. Tastes of all sorts of things. In paradise, there are colors no one has ever imagined. Tastes that never anyone has ever imagined. I think we've got doctors here. How many taste buds have we got in this world? What was it? I did a bit of anatomy, but I forgot. You never use it ever again. Shows how useless some of the courses are. Just teach you, teach you, teach you, and then you go up and the computer does it all. Seriously. Two years you can become a doctor. I'm just kidding. But I mean, you know, taste buds. We only taste all these things. I'm joking. Maybe two years being a dentist, maybe. But all these taste buds in your tongue. That's why you... Can you imagine billions, billions of taste buds of different sorts? Now you can imagine the reality. My brothers and sisters, such is paradise that we are promised. And this is what we are looking for. And this is what keeps our hope going. Some people, I have conclude with this, they ask me, is it bad or selfish if I just worship Allah just for paradise? Some people say, no, I worship Allah because I love Him. Liar. <laughs> That's impossible. You can say it, but no. Listen, Allah promised you paradise from Him, isn't that correct? You will only see Allah in paradise, isn't that correct? Allah gifted you paradise, isn't that correct? If you love Allah, you will love His gift. If you don't love Allah's gift, it's a bit rude. So when you love Allah's gift, Allah loves it. And Rasulullah said, "Inna Allah yuhibu an yara athar ni'mati abd, ni'mati ala abd." Allah loves to see the blessings on His servant, even in this world. So, brothers and sisters, you love Allah means you love His gift, and both of them go hand in hand. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us paradise. Will you remember me? I will remember you. Will you vouch for your friend? That's why you should have righteous friends. Because the righteous friends, they will tell you, but they will also remember you. The others will throw you under the bus. My brothers and sisters, finally, all this talk does not mean that you cannot enjoy life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, enjoy the blessings that Allah has given you. You want to wear nice clothes, wear them. You want to drive a nice car, drive it. You want to have a nice house, have a nice house. You want to enjoy life and go on holidays, go. Eat what you like, but make sure it's halal. And make sure you give your zakat. And make sure you don't let it get into your heart. And make sure that you are not arrogant. And you use what Allah has given you for the sake of Allah. Only to improve you and make you grow as a Muslim. Not to make you become haughty and miserly. Then you got the best of both worlds. Say, who is it that forbid Allah's servants from enjoying the blessings that, I, that Allah had made for them in this life? Say, it is all for them in this paradise. They will not be, even be accountable. On the day of judgment, we will not even diminish any of the blessings even in the hereafter just because they took it from here, unless it was in haram. So repent to Allah if it is from a haram source. And continue to repent and get closer to Allah. In Allah, Ghafur Rahim. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. May Allah bless you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Jazakallah khayn and Shaykh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the intercession of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, for those who have been scanning the QR code, we're going to have a game of Kahoot with the Shaykh. If you don't know what Kahoot is, it's the game that we're going to play.